May our gracious God give us instruction and strength and faith as we go to him and learn from him today. One of the most basic things that we understand as Christians who look to Jesus Christ as our Savior is that our lives are not our own. That as Christians, it is our great desire to go out and live lives that are pleasing to our God, right? It's called sanctification, the Christian life. Knowing that you've been forgiven, you want to go out and live for your God who has saved you. And sanctification is a very important part of who we are as Christians. And it's always very important for us as Christians to take our Christian life very seriously, to consider it every day and to think how we can daily live in praise and honor and thanks for our God who has saved us. But living with sincere thoughts and desires and an eagerness to please our God through our Christian life can come with some bit of trouble, can't it? Because often, even as we go out and we say, I want to live my life for you, Jesus, we find that we fail to live our life for Jesus the way that we want to. And sometimes when we go out to live our life for Jesus, what can happen is that we spend more of our time thinking about what we're doing for Jesus than what Jesus has done for us. And we can kind of get mixed up in our Christian life and put more emphasis on ourselves than on our Savior. And so while God exhorts and encourages us to never lose our zeal, to live as Christians and live the Christian life and always seek on how to do that, it also comes with a bit of, of qualification to make sure that we don't go too far overboard and either despair over the fact that we're not living the way that we want to for Jesus or live with pride in ourselves that look at what I'm doing for you, Jesus. And there's a, there's a very clear, uh, narrow road that we follow when we live our Christian life. As we seek to live as Christians and live under God's grace and, 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 and go about, Jesus keeps us from both despair and pride with the words that he has for us today from Luke chapter 15. They are really fundamental words of instruction for us so that we understand our whole place in Jesus' kingdom and our whole lives in Jesus' kingdom. So I'd like for you to take out your service folder, and I'm going to read the entire section for you, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about it and see these words of instruction that Jesus has for us. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who does not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. As we look at these words from our God, we recognize the situation that Jesus was in at this time. It was a familiar situation. If you read the Gospels, you see, you see this happen time and time again. Jesus is out there preaching and teaching like he always did, and there are two camps of people that are following him. 
On the one hand, you have the camp of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were the religious leaders of the time. They were the ones who were around God's word every single day, and they were the ones that were out there to teach the people God's word. They were very religious people, extremely religious people. And for that, they had something going for them, being religious people, always in God's word and taking it seriously. But the problem that the Pharisees had was that they weren't looking correctly into God's word. You see, though they were very religious and they surrounded themselves with God's word, what they focused on in God's word and what they thought was the point of God's word was the law. And that was all that they focused on. Law, law, law. It was all about how I am doing. What am I doing to please God? And they went so far as to take God's law and add to it several hundred more laws. Because they thought, well, if God's law is good, if I add these other laws that, that sort of have this godly sphere attached to them, then I can even be better. And so the Pharisees spent all their days studying God's law and saying, how can I live for God? The problem is, is that they weren't even looking at God's law rightly because God's law rightly comes with condemnation, doesn't it? When you truly look into God's law and you truly seek to obey God's law, what you finally realize is that you can't obey God's law. His standard for obedience is perfection. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard, how hard I try, no matter how hard those Pharisees tried, they could not reach that standard of perfection. But see, that didn't matter to the Pharisees. Because what they decided was that God's standard of perfection really wasn't the true standard. The true standard was really just as long as I'm better than other people or just as long as I'm trying really hard, then God will be okay with me. Because after all, if you compare me to other people, I'm actually pretty good. And God wouldn't really ask me for perfection. He just asked me to try as hard as I can. And so the Pharisees, though they were very religious and they surrounded themselves with God's word, were looking at God's word in an improper way and they were becoming prideful in themselves because they had an overemphasis on the works that they were doing. The other side of the spectrum, following Jesus, you had the tax collectors and sinners, in quotes. The tax collectors and sinners were about as far the opposite side of spiritual, spiritual life as the Pharisees were. The tax collectors were Jews who were sellouts because they got hired by the Romans to uh, collect the taxes from the Jewish people. And of course, the Jewish people said, we're God's people. We don't want to have to pay taxes to anybody else, especially these Gentile people. And now our own brothers are out there getting hired by these, by these Romans. And, not, and even more, they're not just collecting the taxes that the Romans are asking, these sellouts are actually being dishonest and they're asking for more money than what the Romans so that they can put it in their own pockets. It was a form of usury among Jews that God strictly forbade and that in, in, in love should never have been happening, but those tax collectors for their own financial benefit were, were exploiting. And then you had the sinners. And when the Bible uses this term sinners, in quotes as you see it, it's referring to any number of class of individual that was recognizably understood within the Jewish culture. You're talking about prostitutes. You're talking about people that went out and did awful, heinous things, murderers and, 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 and those who, who lived their lives completely on the opposite end of the spectrum as what the Pharisees thought that they were living theirs. The, and these were people who just went out and did heinous things and showed themselves that they were 
not really taking God seriously at all. So which one are you? Are you a Pharisee? Do you walk your Christian life thinking, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, after all, God can't expect everything from me. I'm walking pretty well. I got my standards. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but you know who is? Do you go walking your Christian life creating your own standards? Well, God surely will accept this from me. Because I think it's pretty good. Are you a tax collector and a sinner? The other end of the spectrum, do you not take God's law seriously at all? Are you outgoing and saying, you know what, I'm just going to kind of forget about what God says because I really like doing this. You know what, I have a right to get angry and, 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 and hate my brother, don't I? After all, look what he's doing to me. I have a right to get greedy and to think that I should have more than what I have. Which are you? Neither is good, is it? I would suspect, oh, I don't suspect, I know. But when I look into my own heart and my own life, at any moment of any day, I'm both. Sometimes I think I'm doing pretty well, and other times, I think I don't need Jesus at all. And if you look into your own heart and your own mind, I suspect that every day you'll find a little Pharisee and a little sinner. Both in there, won't you? It is to Pharisees and to sinners that Jesus addresses these words today, right? As we recognize that even though we go out and we strive to live the Christian life, that we do fail in so many ways. But there's an important distinction that we understand in these verses, and it has to do with the heart of both these Pharisees and these tax collectors and sinners in this text. Did you notice the Pharisees and the, and the, uh, and the, and the teachers of the law, did you, did you get where their heart is? Did you read that? Where, where is their heart? They said, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them, they muttered, as they looked at Jesus and, and who he was dealing with. You see their heart? Their heart was a prideful heart. I can't believe that Jesus would ever take this person into account. You ever do that with anybody? You see, you see on the news, you see those just terrible people, and you go, I just can't believe that. I just can't believe how awful those people are. And that heart of the pharisaical heart that puts yourself up above somebody else is a very improper heart. But in this text, what we recognize is that those tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus with a whole different heart. And we understand that with the way that Jesus addresses this whole thing. The tax collectors and the sinners were gathering around to hear him. These were people, it seemed, that were coming around to Jesus recognizing their sin, recognizing that their lives were a mess, and recognizing that they needed Jesus to give them words of comfort. But the words that Jesus says to address Pharisees and tax collectors, both who we are, are words that apply to both Pharisees and tax collectors and therefore apply to us. 